Actually, we have a brief advertisement um, uh, for uh, Central Number Theory, which is a new um, journal uh, that is starting, uh, and it's uh, under a very different model than uh, traditional journals. Uh, in particular, the standard for publication is that articles should be extremely useful to the community, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, uh, original research breakthroughs, uh, it, the, the standard is usefulness. So if you are doing some computations or developing computational tools in particular that might be of a lot of use uh, to other, other people, uh, that might be a kind of paper that uh, you could consider submitting to Essential Number Theory and feel free to, uh, to talk to me or uh, contact uh, any of the editors if, if you have an idea and wonder if it's an appropriate paper. Okay, um, and so I w we'll get on. Okay, and now we have the next next announcement I wanted to make. Yeah, a little follow up um, from yesterday. Um, so I should have mentioned when I was talking about um, error terms. Um, um, Bob Huff has a paper called "Equidistribution of Bounded Torsion CM Points," where he gives a theoretical heuristic suggesting, um, I mean, it's, yeah, uh, that the the average of the Z mod K Z moment, say over imaginary quadratic fields, uh, where K is odd, might be one, and then a secondary term uh, that's decaying like x to the minus one half plus one over K. So for k equals 3, that would give the minus 1 sixth exponent that um, I mentioned was actually a theorem of, of Bhargava, Schenker, uh, Zimmerman, Taniguchi, and Thorne. And then for k equals 5, it would give this, this minus uh, 3 tenths, which would be a faster decay, which was the direction we saw on the graph, that the 5 moment seemed to be approaching the limit faster. Um, uh, in any case, he looks at at just a small amount of data um, for this and says that for, in the paper says that for k equals five and seven that this looks good with the data and for k greater than or equal to nine it looks not so good. Um, uh, so I think there's that it's still very much open to understand what these secondary terms would be but um, I wanted to make sure to point that out that this, this is one uh, paper that's, that's in the mix um, that you should know about. You want to think about the speed of convergence of these moments. All right. So uh, today um, I'm going to talk about conjectures for class group distributions for higher degree extensions. So we're going to let G be a finite group, and we're going to take K over Q Galois G extension. And so we're going to say, ask about the distribution of the class groups of K as K varies over G extensions. But one thing happens here is that these class groups of G extensions, they're not just finite abelian groups. They have an action of G um, because the Galois group of K over Q acts on the class group. Uh, and so they are modules for the group ring Z adjoined G. So that's just another way of saying that they have an action of G that's compatible with their Abelian group structure. And so since these class groups are ZG modules, we should ask for their distribution as ZG modules, not just, uh, not just abelian groups. That's sort of part of the philosophy. Uh, so here's a sort of thought experiment. Uh, you know, when we were just, say, for, in, for imaginary uh, quadratic fields and real quadratic fields, when we were talking about the class group, we, were, we ask about the distribution of the class group, not the class number. I mean, some people, you might think about the class number. A lot of people, you know, especially you're doing analytic number theory, a lot of things work just with the class number. Um, but if you, if you had tried to do that, you would have, for, say, some number in, these relative probabilities, say, for the case of real quadratic fields, that would be the sum over all the finite abelian groups of order n of this of this kind of uh, term. Now, you can write that all explicitly because we know, you know, in terms of the prime factorization of n, what all the finite abelian groups of order n. But this is, in terms of n, is just some really garbage expression. 
uh, completely impenetrable what it means. Um, and then once we, but once you consider the group structure, then you're, for each group, you're just saying it occurs with this relative probability. And those terms all have a lot of, lot of meaning and are much, much easier to understand. Um, so similarly uh, to the fact that, you know, the, the conjectures for class groups of quadratic fields look much nicer and more sensible when you think about them as distributions on groups and not on numbers that, uh, that record the size of the group. We should think about um, distributions for class groups with the full structure that they have. So in this case for GAWA, G extensions, that is as a ZG module. Okay. Um, all right, so let's think about the class group as a ZG module. So there is a particular element I'm going to call N, thinking of it like norm, uh, in the group ring, which is the sum over all of the group elements. And this, this N element on the class group um, acts as zero, sending it all to zero. And why is that? Well, the norm thing was a hint, right? Uh, this, this would take, takes an ideal and multiplies it all by all of its conjugates. Um, and uh, maybe we should say, um, oh, I just realized maybe I need some, 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 let's say, you know, we're at primes away from dividing G. I'll just say that for now. Because um, this is what we're really going to talk about. Let me just say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Remember, P is a prime. Uh, P is a okay. What? Oh, oh, okay. I, I was just. We're we're about to restrict to that. So, I, so I I was just doing that to, to make it to make it a simpler statement but yeah okay all right which I, okay which I was about to write here all right in any case so um, uh, so the then since we're going to think about just just as before for, for because it simplifies some issues we're going to just think about the p torsion in the uh, the or the p power torsion the silo p subgroup of the class group for a particular p um, then the ring that is acting, uh, more precisely, we can say instead of just the group ring acting, we actually have the action of this following ring R, which is so uh, ZPG, so this group ring. And so the, the ZP here uh, is, is acting, and it's that is that we're putting that there basically to, uh, to emphasize that we're only. Uh, looking at the CELO P subgroup, uh, that there's only P power torsion here in the in the finite modules. Um, so, so the ring that acts on the CELO P subgroup of the class group is this group ring, uh, ZPG mod this norm element uh, N. Okay. All right. So, as before, we. In the uh, quadratic case, we separated the fields based on their behavior at infinity. Uh, and there's not so much in the quadratic case that can go on in terms of behavior at infinity, but it can get a little more complicated uh, for, uh, for larger G. And so we're going to keep track of the decomposition group at infinity, uh, uh, G infinity. So that's a subgroup of G. So another way to say that um, here is what that decomposition group is. So that is... Uh, group of order two that is is where complex conjugation lands. So, so here what this is is keeping track of the conjugacy class in G of complex conjugation. Okay, so this S G G gamma is going to be all of the G extensions, but that have a particular um, a particular behavior at infinity, which we mean like complex conjugation acts as a certain element or conjugacy class uh, in G. Okay. And so um, Cohen and Martinet, building on the conjectures of Cohen and Lindstra, made conjectures uh, for, for 
class groups of higher degree extensions, and in particular, their conjectures imply um, that for p that it doesn't divide g and f a function of r module. So this is you know we're, this is the, the group ring thing acting here, and we're thinking of this as an r module. This following kind of average, um, and you won't find it written quite this way in their paper, um, which is why I sort of wrote over here a reference where we show that their conjectures. Um, uh, imply this distribution. Okay, and so this is the sort of technical kind of statement here that we saw before in the quadratic case. So we're, we're taking a limit as x goes to infinity. We're averaging over fields of discriminant up to x. Here, this is saying what fields are we averaging over? The g extensions with um, g infinity, their decomposition group at infinity, or how complex conjugation behaves. And over those functions, you know, we're averaging, sorry, over those fields, we're averaging some function of their um, class groups as R modules. All right, so F is a function uh, that, that, that sees the R module structure. And what do we get? We get the average of that, that function over, um, over P group R modules uh, with a particular distribution, uh, and each R module occurs with with you know th this weight, and then there's a denominator here that makes uh, you know the w there's the sum of the weights so that so that you have a, a proper proper average here. Um, Can I ask? Uh, yes. Does it, do those conjectures imply this for all f, or are they applied only for reasonable f? Well, the conjecture or says for reasonable f, so it only applies it for reasonable f, I suppose. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yes. Yeah, so the conjecture and the conjectures don't give a precise uh, definition of reasonable. In the notes I give a few references to a few papers that have kind of tried to grapple with what reasonable might mean, but yes, yeah. So good yes. 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 Th that what a what a G extension properly should be is a is a is an extension with a Isomorphism, isomorphism of its Galois group to G, so that you can make. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Right. Otherwise, the class group is not a, a ZG module. Right, right. Yeah. Great questions. Um, yes. Yeah, so, again, I suppose let, I'll just say so these should be. I mean, this is reasonable. Where reasonable isn't, it isn't defined, after all, they're just heuristics or conjectures. Um, uh, and, uh, yes, um, one. Uh, I'll, I'll just sort of repeat the, this question. In order for this class group to actually be a G module, one has to have an identification of G with the Galois group. So that has to be part of the, the data of what we mean by Galois G extension. And that is uh, handled in the notes with some, with some terminology of when we fix the isomorphism and uh, when we don't. Um, and what is this? So this term here, makes a lot of sense. We've got the automorphisms as an R module. And what there's this term here. So this is the is the the elements of A that are fixed by this G infinity, that are fixed by complex conjugation. So this is the fixed, you know, the fixed elements of A. Okay. So that's how this this term is where the behavior at infinity comes in. Um, and so now you can see that, oh, you might have um, Different, different elements of complex conjugation that give you the same signature, say, of your field, but they're going to give, um, give different, different behaviors here. Um, and summarizing, how you might say this more informally is that the conjectures say that the class group is distributed as an R module with these relative probabilities. So, I mean, we write this big equation with <laughs> the two sides and the big fractions and everything, and that's, that's, that's sort of informally uh, what's happening. Uh, that in this family, with this ordering, this is saying that the class group is distributed as R module with relative probabilities. And what relative means is that the probability isn't this, it's this divided by the sum of all of these weights, so that they're actually numbers that add up to one. Okay, um, and this distribution, 
uh, we were talking yesterday about how the moments are so important for distribution. So this distribution has moments. Um, the bth moment is 1 over the size of uh, the part of b that's fixed by the g infinity. So that looks a lot like what we had for quadratic fields, except now that, that a to the u is being replaced by this. And you can think of the exercise. I think it's the exercise in the notes. You can make sure. Is that, is that consistent with what we, um, uh, what we said in the quadratic case? And indeed, indeed it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, and just as in the uh, situation we were talking about for these distributions that were predicted for class groups of quadratic fields, these moments determine a unique distribution. Uh, and I should say a couple of things. The moments here now are surjections in the category of R modules. And this, everything kind of continues to follow this philosophy, which is like you should use all the structure that you have. So, so before surjections were just in the category of abelian groups, now that we're thinking about distributions of R modules, they're in the category of R modules. And this is a determined unique distribution of R modules. <laughs> right. mm -hmm. So it's important to, to know what, what structure your class group has, what category you should be working in. Um, all right, so now some warnings about these, these conjectures. Uh, these uh, conjectures, or maybe we should call them heuristics. Uh, the, the heuristics ne conjectures need some modifications. Um, so first, um, uh, Mala did some empirical computations of class groups, and he, his work has really been um, the, the, the main work looking uh, systematically at uh, class group distributions of higher degree fields and also over other base fields other than, than Q. And it's now a decade old. Uh, so uh, I, there's really a lot of, of space for more computations to be helpful. But through his, his computations, it, you know, from the, from the tables he was creating, it looked like the conjectures were wrong at two. Uh, and even though for my talks I've been focusing using Q as a base field for everything that we do. Of course, there's a, th a theory where you could replace Q by an arbitrary number field, say, K0. And so more generally, his tables, if you know, he was using, say, Q adjoining the square root of minus 3 uh, as a base field, he was having some, some problems matching the conjectures at P equals 3. And so more generally, when P divides the order of the group of uh, roots of unity in your base field, it looks like the, the conjectures were off. And so this p why people are referring to this as roots of unity issues. Now, since Q just has two roots of unity over Q, this only affects the, the conjectures at P equals 2. Um, and uh, there uh, is you know, uh, work trying to understand um, what one needs to do uh, in this case. And there are several references in the um, notes. And this is also... A, area that I'm, I'm actively working on and trying to, to understand um, uh, w what, what should be fixed here. Um, and then um, another, another caveat, another way in which these uh, conjectures are wrong as stated. Uh, so uh, Bartel and Lindstrom have a paper where in which, among other things, they pointed out that uh, for, for some groups, when you order by discriminant uh, G extensions, a positive proportion of those uh, will contain some fixed subfield. Uh, and that subfield will have some class group. And that class group will affect a positive proportion of the, the class groups of G fields. And that seem, can really throw off uh, the conjectures. Um, and so they suggest uh, to fix this by uh, replacing the discriminant by uh, another ordering, another invariant that doesn't have this property. Uh, so perhaps uh, the product of ramified primes, which is similar in a lot of ways to the discriminant. We kind of feel like it's so in some ways measuring the, the same thing, uh, but there are a lot of uh, reasons to believe that if we order fields by the product of ramified primes, you won't have this positive proportion problem um, and that 
makes the conjectures more, more likely to be true. And there, it's, there are also other invariants, uh, depending on the group, for which one doesn't expect to have this positive proportion issue, um, uh, including for many, for many groups by um, the ordering by discriminant. Uh, and so it's kind of interesting to wonder, like, well, what should work? Should any ordering work um, that doesn't have this positive proportion? Or should, should we, we stick with something like the product of ramified primes? And there are a couple suggested projects exploring this question of what the appropriate ordering uh, might be in the notes. And I think that, that somehow there is nothing, nothing in the spirit of the original heuristics or conjectures are tied to the discriminant ordering. It's more of a, of a oh, as we look, look among fields and, OK, we have to order them somehow. So we, we order them by discriminant. So I think this is a really an interesting question uh, to understand how different orderings affect things and which ones might be most appropriate. So those are our two, um, two known uh, problems with that conjecture that I just stated. Um, I will remark that if you avoid roots of unity in the base field and you do order by the product of ramified primes, um, that a paper of mine with Yuan Lu and David Zerg Brown shows that uh, these the conjectures that I just stated in the Gawal case hold over um, the function field of QT with a early uh, Q goes to infinity limit. So in some limit where you take Q go to infinity before you take the X go going to infinity, one does um, uh, one uh, one does have have the conjectures. So that is suggests that uh, you know. Th there aren't too many more things to fix, but there could certainly be both things that disappear in the Q go to infinity limit or a rise in the analogy between number fields and function fields being not perfect. That could be, that could be going on um, in this situation. Not to mention this only addresses this, this one, one ordering. Yeah. Yes, question. No, you do not fix the characteristic. Yeah. Yes. Well, um, I don't. That wait, you're saying usually referred to? I don't know if people use the language large Q limit. To, I mean, there's sort of two. I mean, let me just say there are sort of two ways that you could. Um, take a limit wh where you put the Q limit here and you put it outside here and, and <laughs> roughly, this is the easier <laughs> one. Uh, and I don't know if people say large Q limit specifically to, to refer to one of those two places. Or I, I would just use it more generally when you know, somewhere you've taken a limit as Q goes to infinity. Um, other questions? And sometimes when people you, you say large Q limit, I think they do mean that you fix the characteristic and like Q go to infinity, that's a totally different kind of thing. Yeah, um, but okay. So um, that is what the, the conjectures are for um, uh, distributions of class groups of Galois fields. So what about non-Galois extensions? Um, um, especially because one um, might want to start working with low degree extensions. You know, you start you have cubic extensions. Well, some of them are Galois, but then you have non Galois cubics, and obviously, like nice, uh, accessible case of fields you might want to understand something about, but they are not Galois. All right, so here we're going to take G to be a finite group and H to be a subgroup. And we'll start with a Galois extension, L over Q, which will be a Galois G extension. But then we're going to take the H fixed field, um, and that will be K. And so this is how we're going to think about our non-Galois extensions. They all sit inside of some uh, Galois extension, for example, their Galois closure. Um, and so we can think of them as, 
as you know, for a certain G and a certain subgroup H, the, the fixed field of some Galois G extension by H. All right. And so for a prime P that doesn't divide the order of the group G, uh, it, in, in this setting, the P CO subgroup of the uh, class group of K is simply the H invariance of the P CO subgroup of the class group of L, just like K is the H invariance of um, of L, so the you know the elements fixed uh, fixed by every element of H, um, and you can uh, see uh, this is shown shown in the notes, or maybe there's exercise about it in the notes um, how this is the case. And it, the, the, but this map is, for example, just by the inclusion of ideals of from K into L. Um, so. Because of that, in principle, the cohen martinet conjectures for the distribution of the class group um, of L as a G module imply conjectures for the distribution of the class group of K as, as a P group. Because, you know, we have some distribution on G modules. We can have the forgetful functor where we just take every G module to its underlying abelian group and we have some distribution and it pushes forward and uh, um, and then you could say well what is the probability of getting some sort of P group okay it must be the sum over all of the um, all of the G module structures you can put on that P group of one over okay but that's a lot uh, that's that's maybe not uh, not so easy to to think about and in fact it kind of reminds us of uh, my th thought experiment at the beginning where I said, oh, um, you know, what if we tried to do the cohen heuristics but just asked about the distribution on the sizes of the groups and then your probabilities are some weird funky sum of, 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 of something. Um, so were, you, were you right? Forgetful? You, you, this is the H invariance functor, yeah? Mm. Oh, yes, sorry. Yes, 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 thank you. It's not the, f uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, um, yes. Thank you. <laughs> I guess it does forget something, but that wasn't good to write forgetful <laughs> there. Yes, I mean the, the functor that takes the H invariance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but so we, so in a paper of mine with um, my former graduate student, Wei Tong Wang, we actually, we work out what, what this push forward is, what distribution you see in the non gawa case, at, you know, implied already by the conjectures in the Gawa case. Um, all right, so I'm going to tell you about that. And the easiest case to say what is implied um, is uh, the following. So... All right, we always, we have our G and our subgroup H that work, our non gawa fields, remember, are the fixed fields for H. So G acts um, on the, the cosets, so uh, the, the of, of G mod H. So this is a, it have to be a group, this, this, the, this is just a set of cosets. So since G acts on this set, um, G acts, G has a representation uh, uh, over, say, the complex numbers of dimension the number of cosets, and this is also, I mean, this is also the, the induced representation uh, from the trivial representation from H up to G is another way to write uh, this representation. So this is a, a representation over the complex numbers of the finite group G. And then I'm going to build, uh, and inside of that, there's always one copy of the trivial representation uh, because, say, G acts on the basis elements here by permuting them around, so the sum of those basis elements is, uh, always gives you a one-dimensional trivial representation. So I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to throw that out. Um, and then I get this, this, oops, this representation here, so the induced representation minus one copy of the trivial representation. And the easiest case is when that is an irreducible um, representation. And I write absolutely, I, I called it absolutely irreducible in the notes because one also sometimes considers the representations over Q and I'm saying it should be irreducible over C. Um, all right. And so in this case uh, where that induced representation, you know, minus the trivial representation is absolutely irreducible, um, the uh, conjectures of Cohen-Martinet uh, 
say the following, um, that if you, you know, take class group uh, averages. So here, notice how I set up this average. The sum is over, over Galois fields. These were our Galois fields. And it's ordered by the discriminant of the Galois field. Uh, that is just how, the, you know, how it works because of the conjectures that they made, uh, though one, as I mentioned before, might want to consider other orderings. But then this here, this is we're taking the class group here of these, you know, what I was calling K, the class groups of the fixed field. So we're only asking about the distribution of the class groups of the H fixed fields. Um, and uh, we show that it's given by the following, you know, the conjecture suggests that it should be given by the following Oh, I forgot to put the F up here. Um, the following distributions, there should be an F up here. Where, uh, this average um, with weights A to the U times uh, the size of the automorphism group of A. And so here U is the number um, of cycles of this decomposition group, G infinity, on the cosets minus 1 which is also turns out to be the unit rank of our you know, non-Galois uh, field here, the fixed field. All right, so U is the, is the unit rank. Um, and so that is maybe easier to match to the quadratic case where we had you know, U was zero in the imaginary uh, case and U is one in the, in the real case. Okay, so again, just to sort of, we have the big uh, formula, just to summarize uh, what that is saying, is it saying when we take these H fixed fields, the, the, their class groups uh, should be distributed with relative probability one over size of A to the U automorphisms of A, where U here is, is the unit rank of the, of the field K. Um, and this distribution uh, here, uh, you know, we already talked about it a lot in the cases u equals 0 and 1 uh, before, and it's just, it is like those determined by its b moments, which are the size of b to the minus u. Um, and I should just point out, you know, I said that there uh, were um, some caveats, some warnings, some roots of unity issues, and which counting invariant you use issues with the original conjectures, and they all apply equally well here because this is literally just telling you what the Galois conjectures uh, imply in the non-Galois case. Um, however, this gives um, one, you know, many, many more examples. You know, so for example, this includes. Uh, this, this case where this, this particular representation is irreducible includes the degree D S D fields. So what we sort of think of as the generic fields, uh, the degree D fields whose Galois closure uh, has group S D. And so in particular, the non-Galois cubics. All right. Okay. And so one also takeaway from this uh, is that when this representation, this induced representation, you know, minus one copy of the trivial representation, when that is irreducible, the class groups of the fixed fields here, these non galois fields, they have no, no additional structure. And w why is that the takeaway? Well, in this philosophical context, the fact that the probabilities mainly had to do with the size of the automorphism group just as a group of the... Um, you know, of the different options sort of indicates that, that we, you know, found the, 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 the structure on these objects, which is that they are groups. <laughs> All right. However, so when this representation uh, is reducible, um, then actually these class groups of, of, you know, non-Galois, not necessarily Galois fields always actually have extra structure. They're not just groups. So here's a, um, maybe a first example, which is easy to think about. So we were talking about quartic D4 fields um, on the first day. So if we let G be D4, say the symmetries of, of a square, then there's an index 4 um, 
subgroup, H, say, generated by the transposition 2, 4. So this is an index 4 subgroup. And so when we're taking um, a Galois G field and then taking its H invariance, we're getting quartic D4 extensions. And as we mentioned before, these are quadratic extensions of quadratic extensions. And that top quadratic extension we know is Galois. So there's, there is some automorphism uh, of that, that top extension fixing the, the intermediate extension. And so quartic D4 extensions actually have two automorphisms. So they're not Galois. They don't have four automorphisms. But they have two automorphisms. And of course, if your field K has automorphisms, those automorphisms are going to act on the class group. And so the class group is not just here then a Z module. It's a you know, module for the group ring of, of the automorphisms of the field, if at least. However, that is not the only way in which the class groups acquire extra structure. Um, uh, so for example, um, if we take G, we could take G to be H5, sorry, A5, the alter, uh, uh, fifth alternating group. Um, and here I wrote down a particular index 10 um, subgroup. So in this case, when L is a G extension and we take this fixed field, so this is a degree 10 A5 field, you might call it. It's a degree 10 field whose Galois closure has A5. That won't have any automorphisms. But this induced representation uh, is not irreducible. Um, and I promised you that in that case, there would be some extra structure on the, the class group. And that occurs uh, here. And so let me, let me tell you now about what that, um, what that additional uh, structure is. Okay, so, um, all right, so I'm going to write down E for a particular element in my group ring here. And I'm thinking it was my group ring, but there were these decorations. We took like the ZP version because we're only thinking about the CLP subgroup, and we quotient it out by this norm element because we knew it acted trivially. Um, and so, but in that, in that group ring, which I was calling R, I'm going to take an eigenpotent element here, the average uh, you know, of, the, of, of the elements H for each H in our, in our subgroup H. So 1 over the size of H times this sum. Um, and this, uh, it's eigenpotent uh, in the group ring. That isn't, isn't hard to check since H is a subgroup. But it's not the kind of you know, eigenpotence often in this kind of uh, semi-simple situation. You're, you think a lot about the central eigenpotence. This is not necessarily a central eigenpotent because H you know, doesn't have to be a normal subgroup. Um, OK, but I can build that eigenpotent. Um, and then um, uh, from that eigenpotent, I'm going to build another ring, a T. And T is uh, the, the elements sort of you can think of as a, sub, uh, as a subset of R uh, of the form E, R, E. So that subset of R, E, R, E, is additively closed. You can check that. And it's multiplicatively closed, because if I have like E something E and E something E, I still have E's on the outside. Um, but probably most people would not want to call this a subring, because uh, while this ERE has a multiplicative uh, identity, which is E, that is not the multiplicative identity of R. But in any case, it does have its own multiplicative identity. So, uh, so this, is a, this, is, this is a ring here. OK? Um, and another way uh, to think about this ring is that it's an order, indeed, maybe I should have said like a maximal order. It's a maximal order um, in the Hecke algebra of finite groups uh, that we write like this. So that's only useful if you've already thought about the Hecke algebra of finite groups. Um, I'm just saying this is another way of writing that same sort of thing, you know, except I'm taking an integral, integral version of it. And the thing about this ring um, is that if I have a R module, so then, then this, this new ring T, the R with the sort of these eigenpotents uh, from H on either side of it, T naturally acts on the H invariance of, of B. And so there are some exercises about that in the notes, but sort of briefly, you know, uh, you, you, you just 
you know, literally act uh, by how this element, you know, tells you to act, and because you have an E here on the left, you'll end up with, um, with an H invariant. So, you know, when you multiply something by E, it becomes, it becomes H invariant. That's exactly what that averaging over, over E does. Um, Okay. So, um, and I should say, I have been um, uh, using uh, all along continually the assumption that P doesn't divide the order of G, which makes this all much simpler. Um, uh, however, one can develop this, uh, this theory in the case when P divides G. Uh, but it's much more complicated. And where is I using that? I'm using that s so that I can invert the order of H and not have to, 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 to worry about that. And it's much more subtle to build the appropriate maximal order um, in, the, in the Hecke algebra when P divides the order of G. But um, yeah, so I'm, I'm taking advantage of that so that when I, oops, when I act by 1 over H, I'm, I can just do that easily because I'm acting on a, on a P group where, it, um, where P doesn't divide the order of H. Okay. All right. And so, um, you know, we've just said, so if B is an R module, then, then the H invariants are a T module. And so remember, the, the case of interest here was we had some class group um, of L, which was an R module, and then when we took the, uh, the H invariance, we got the class group of our non-Galois field. Um, and so then that tells us that those are, are a T module. Okay, so um, maybe I'll just say that. I said X on, that's kind of how you would say it if you were talking about a group. I should say B sub H is a T module. Okay, all right. Okay. And so um, now that actually works in any case, uh, even when, you know, the, the, the w whatever representation was irreducible. But of course, sometimes uh, T is just ZP. So if I say, okay, you're a finite abelian P group and you're also a ZP module, that's not extra structure. That's, what you, that's the structure you already had. Um, and so that's the case that this T is giving no additional structure if and only if uh, this... Um, uh, this representation, this induced minus trivial representation, is irreducible. Uh, and so when it's not irreducible, like in that degree 10 A5 fields uh, example that I gave, then there is additional structure as a module for some you know, non-trivial ring uh, on the class groups, even when it's not, say, coming directly from, from automorphisms of the field. Any questions? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. So you can, yeah, you can see in particular um, that, uh, that the, the group ring for the automorphisms of your non gawal field will sit as a subring of T, but T can be bigger than that. I mean, as we saw in the trivial case. In the D4 case, it's actually not. Um, so I gave that D4 example. T is just the group ring of Z mod 2 Z in the D4 case. But you, know, you could have other cases where there are two automorphisms, but the ring T is bigger than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good exercise. I should have put that in the notes to show that the group ring of the automorphisms of the non gala field sits as a, as a subring of this T. Other questions? Yes? Yeah, so this is a great question. So wait, what if, say, like, H was... Um, was a normal, normal subgroup. So, I mean, I kept saying, oh, we're talking about non-Galois extensions, non-Galois extensions. But I never said, oh, yeah, H isn't allowed to be normal. So actually, this applies completely generally, including the case um, 
uh, when H is a normal, um, uh, a normal subgroup. And so part of actually what we show in this paper with Wei Tong Wang is that um, uh, there's a sort of self-consistency of these, of these conjectures because in fact, even in the Galois case, it, it can also be always embedded in bigger Galois fields, and then it's the H invariance for some bigger Galois field. So you could always ask, you know, do the conjectures for some bigger group, and then we take the invariance to get down to the group that we want. You know, are those, are those consistent with the direct um, uh, heuristics for G fields? And they are, and we show that, and yes. So, um, so you could, you know, if, if you... Um, and, and then the upshot to answer your question directly is like, yes, if H is a normal subgroup, what you get here is just the group ring of the, of the quotient group um, so that it's consistent with the original Galois conjectures. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, um, I guess I, yeah, I would just like do a do a, um, a, a computation um, in the you know with the characters uh, it, for you know for the for the representation. So right, you can you can take the um, pairing of the representation with itself, and that'll be one if and only if it's irreducible. So yeah, in some particular case, that that's like a not so bad computation to do with the characters of the finite group G. Good question. Okay. So, but I, I should say, um, uh, that, that leads perfectly to what I'm going to say next, but sometimes VGH is not, uh, not irreducible. Uh, and in those cases, then, I hope, like, I've repeated the philosophy <laughs> enough that uh, you all could sort of uh, know what is going to happen next. We should ask about the distribution of these class groups of these non-Galois fields. So secretly, they're just like any fixed fields, which they could, could be Galois. Um, uh, th but we should ask about these uh, as T-modules, since, since indeed they are T-modules. Um, and then in that case, um, the cohen martinet Conjectures imply that uh, these class groups of the fixed fields are distributed as the following. So I'll just sort of scroll up so we can see the, the, the informal version. So we have, you know, the function with these weights, same thing, same thing. So the informal version is that a group, a T module B, appears with this probability. So we have the automorphisms of B as a T module, certainly that we expect. Um, and then this... This uh, factor here, which we knew somehow has to involve the behavior at infinity to be consistent with everything else, it's a little more complicated. Um, before we took the invariance of the decomposition group at infinity or the invariance of complex conjugation, but that doesn't act on B because B is, is not a mod, it was the, in, you know, it's a T module, it's not a R module. It was, secretly you're thinking of it as like, it's the H invariance of something, so it doesn't have a G action. Um, but if we uh, tensor product with T um, over T with R E, so then this this R E is a uh, is a right uh, T module. That's why we put the E there, so that it would be a right T module, and it's a left R module, which is the the group ring. Then this is precisely the thing that does have uh, an action of G, and so you can take G infinity invariance there. All right, so that's, that becomes a little more uh, complicated of an expression, uh, but that's, that, is, that is precisely uh, what the conjectures predict, that a particular T module um, occurs you know, in this family with this behavior at infinity with this relative probability. Okay. Um, and uh, so um, it would... So, the, so these are a, a lot of predictions, and there, you know, there are a lot of more specific pr predictions by not just considering the Galois fields case, but the implications for the the fixed fields inside those Galois fields. It's a lot of um, 
predictions for a lot of low degree fields besides just quadratic ones. Um, and it would be great to have computational evidence uh, for, or if it happens to be the case, against uh, these, these predictions. And so uh, in the notes, I make uh, many uh, specific uh, suggestions for, for projects of cases where I think computations would be particularly enlightening or use, useful. So especially around what I said were these this warning, these caveats and their, their, their corrections. So around like, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't order by discriminant. Should we order by product of ramified primes? What about some other ordering um, that people have, that's well studied and maybe has good properties? Um, so there are um, many, many suggestions around uh, those. Um, and then also um, there you know, are uh, suggestions in cases where no prediction is made. So in particular, I just gave a fairly exhaustive descriptions of predictions for the primes that don't divide the order of G. Um, and when primes divide the order of G, it is more subtle. So I should say, um, when P divides uh, the order of G, so sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, um, the paper of Cohen, uh, Martinet, makes a prediction, uh, and sometimes not. <laughs> so it depends on the P and the G. <laughs> uh, and it, it is not so complicated for which to, to say um, for which P and what that sometimes means, but maybe a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, and so, so also in the notes, I, I give uh, several examples of cases in which there's no P and G for which there are pretty low degree fields for which there's no prediction made at all. Um, by anyone. So um, I think there are, uh, yeah, there are, it would be very exciting to see uh, more, um, more computational evidence for the, the distribution of class groups. Um, and so, yeah, um, one other thing that I wanted to say um, was, yeah, so when, when P divides G, um, you know, there's, there's more to say for example, like when there is a heuristic even and when there's not and what, what the different behaviors uh, uh, could be. And even though that's beyond the scope of the, the talk, I feel like I'd be really um, remiss to not point out one of the, the major developments in this area uh, recently, um, which was Alex Smith has determined the distribution of the um, LCO subgroups of class groups for CL extensions. So this is the cyclic group of order L I'm talking about here. Um, at, and so this, for example, this includes quadratic extensions and their two um, CLO subgroup. And so this is, in that case, for example, um, precisely the part that we, in my second lecture, I said, oh, we're just going to ignore because we're genus theory tells us about the two torsion. But it only told us about the two torsion. It didn't tell us about the whole CLO2 subgroup. And so there is certainly more that you could say. Um, and he finds that, that distribution of the rest of the CLO2 subgroup beyond the part that we already knew about um, from genus theory and then also the analogous thing in the CL extensions. And his very long-awaited papers are now on the archive. Um, uh, and uh, so you can read those. And actually, if you're interested, um, he is going to be running an online seminar uh, going through those, uh, those papers that are available this fall. Um, and uh, so if you're interested uh, to learn, turn more about that, I encourage you to, to look into that seminar. Um, all right, and that is it for my talks. <laughs>